Hi, I'm Amrit from the Goggle Docs, and today we're talking about continuous glucose monitoring, or CGM, in people living with type 2 diabetes. Now, this smart technology has already been a game changer for people living with type 1 diabetes, like Nick Jonas over here. But does it have a role to play in type 2 diabetes as well? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be taking a deep dive into today, as we look at how healthcare professionals in England are looking to improve access for this technology to people living with type 2 diabetes. But let's start by setting the scene. People who use insulin on a daily basis need to keep track of their glucose levels so that they can adjust their insulin injections accordingly. Too much insulin and they could end up in hypoglycemia. Too little insulin and they could end up in hyperglycemia. And both of these scenarios can be harmful to the body, but in extreme cases, it could even be life-threatening. So that's why for so many decades, people have been checking their glucose by using finger prick tests. Now, although this is valuable information, it's painful, it's inconvenient, and it only provides a snapshot rather than the actual glucose trend that can change across the course of a day and a night. And that's exactly where CGM comes in, giving real-time data 24-7, alerting the user to highs and lows so that they can adjust their insulin doses. And this has revolutionized the care for people living in England who have type 1 diabetes, who almost all now have access to CGM across the country. So what about in type 2 diabetes? Well, we know that not everyone with type 2 diabetes uses insulin, but for those who do, CGM could play a really big role in their care. So that leaves us with one big question. How can we ensure that using CGM is impactful and not only accessible to those people who need it in type 2 diabetes? Well, to answer that question and more, let's head over to the studio where I'm being joined by fellow goggle doc and diabetologist Amma Patana. For a quick refresh on what CGM is, check out our YouTube short. But for now, let's go and chat to Amma. And so this is perhaps a, a time to bring you in, um, uh, Amma. I suppose we've got guidance from NICE, nice yep. uh, about how to use CGM in people uh, living with type 2 diabetes. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of a, a brief summary of uh, the sorts of people who we should be having this discussion with. Yeah, so it, it, it's slightly different than for the type 1 guidance, which we've talked about before. But essentially what NICE has suggested in 2022 was that people with uh, type 2 diabetes who are on multiple dose daily injections of insulin, so don't specify the number as such, but generally it's it's 2 plus, you'd imagine, you know, from mixed premixed insulins to, to basal bolus regimes, they would benefit from a continuous glucose monitor, especially if they're having uh, hypoglycemia, severe disabling hypoglycemia, or, um, you know, need to check monitoring their blood sugars quite closely. Um, and with caveats that you'd also include people who, you know, who require third party administration of insulin, potentially this would add added benefit um, where uh, you know, they can have remote monitoring of the blood sugars and, and regular monitoring of the blood sugars when they, people are giving themselves insulin. Yeah, so it's, this is quite a new area for primary care, I suppose, particularly for people with type 2 diabetes. Um, what sort of setup and support would need to mm -hmm. be in place uh, Probably the, the main question I'm getting asked by colleagues. So, so this is the difficulty because, again, the majority of type 2 diabetes is managed in primary care, as you know, as you, as you do. So um, in order for this to occur, really, you need someone in a way who is able to read and understand the, what this means, be able to educate and impart that to the person or yeah. the carer, and also then be able to understand the readings and receive the readings and, and follow up and manage that. And yeah. and that's not straightforward. You need a kind of multidisciplinary team involvement, really, with that. So that could be sometimes with a community diabetologist who's involved in, in, in primary care, or it could be a specialist primary care physician who is comfortable with that and has a support network. So nurse team, a diabetes nurse team with them as well and, and, and is very comfortable with that which again you can imagine across the whole country there are not too many of that yeah. available um, and of course the sheer numbers of people with type 2 diabetes, again not all will be on insulin and multiple daily injections but again that again has its implications of uh, you need to find everywhere who has someone who is capable of, of, doing, of delivering that care. So we're looking at the right type of person in terms of patient who would benefit yes. with which you, you went through but then also ensuring that locally we have the right setup, whether it be in a GP practice, a community clinic, uh, or regionally in terms of uh, supporting the people who are using the device uh, and carers and relatives of theirs, uh, but also being able to interpret the information yes. and do something with it. There's a counter argument to that saying, well, why do you need to monitor if, 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 if it's If it's the standard instead of 
finger prick, we don't have a support system for finger prick blood sugars. So yeah. why should you have one for a critical monitor if it's just going to give you the readings? Yeah. And it's it's a difficult one. Some you know you can understand the reasoning why you would say that because again it's checking your blood sugars and what you do with it as a patient as long as you understand is fine. But equally now that we have these readings, are we duty bound as yeah clinicians to and get involved with to it. do something about it it's really interesting i suppose it, it, will this lead to more self-care essentially are we empowering mm. people with type 2 diabetes who are perhaps at risk of hypos etc because of their insulin therapy or of actually enhancing their self-care skills and as you say maybe we as clinicians don't need to be involved with it intrinsically but i think would need to individualize wouldn't we? yeah depending on the patient the the person themselves and their, uh, their setup and the local setup as well um okay so um we know actually that cgm can make a real improvement and benefit um perhaps you could just share a little bit about that w what sort of benefits do people get yeah. from using cgm personally but then also clinically as well mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's, 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 there's practical benefits again. So you can imagine if you have, um, you know, injecting insulin and monitoring your blood sugars, you sometimes have to monitor up to 10 times a day, sometimes more, again, if you're feeling unwell. So and just sticking a needle in yourself how many yeah. times. So yeah. from a pure you know, person aspect, it's it's nice not to be able to, you just have to scan it or it sends readings and that's that's straightforward. Um, and that actually has impact on quality of life. And also, um, um, again, a lot of people have worry about hypoglycemia. We know we know that you know, continuously monitoring your blood sugars and, and and checking them regularly can reduce risk of hypoglycemia as well as hyperglycemia. And so there's that 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 reduction in diabetes distress potentially. There's the reduction in hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, um, optimization of HbA1c from a clinical perspective. Um, long to, again, there's some data coming through about complications potentially. So, you know, if you can get optimized HPLNCs or time in range actually rather yeah. than HPLNC, then you, it has impacts on, on, on downline non complications as well. So from a from a cost benefit as well. Yeah. There's that element that would be very fine. There's there's there's, there's a whole load of kind of added benefits that we're seeing and we'll get even more data from as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got some clinical outcomes which improve mm -hmm. um which then down the line you said obviously would hopefully reduce the risk of complications yeah. um i suppose in terms of the practicalities as well uh, you know carers family members can be more yeah. involved in the support um of their loved one uh, if they so need um administrating insulin as well you know I mean, it's a blood sugar monitoring device and yeah. but it tells you if there's trends going upwards downwards you know kind of what you, you you're a bit more aware of, of what you're doing which is why it kind of keeps your blood sugars a bit stable your timing range is better yeah um and perhaps at the top of the the video i didn't go into uh, any detail of what happens with that glucose data obviously it wirelessly goes either to a to a device specifically for yeah. glucose monitoring or a smartphone as well and then that's where it can be shared with yeah. with carers family and your clinician as well so that's that's uh, perhaps a, a part that i didn't uh, quite explain earlier on okay so you mentioned cost effectiveness yeah. so we know that actually nice have have done some analysis on this haven't it and um you know it does appear to be a relatively cost effective um technology uh being used in certain cohorts and and, and comparable and potentially even more cost effective than certain medications we know with sglt2 inhibitors the analysis that nice has done actually perhaps would show that cgm use in these groups of people with type 2 diabetes uh with this high dependency on insulin uh, CGM might be a more cost-effective technology. So that's quite an interesting uh, interesting analysis that NICE has to do as part of their guideline development, isn't it? Yeah. Um, are there any challenges that we need to consider here? I mean, we've talked about how great this technology is, how potentially cost-effective it might be, how it will improve lives potentially. What are the things that we need to think about in terms of implementing this and challenges you know, to the person you know, beyond that as well, locally. So we've touched upon it already in terms of having the setup for it. Sure. So we, we know that. I'm not going to yeah. talk about it, but we know that. thing. So there are a few other things we can learn from type 1 diabetes when it was, uh, C, when CGM was, you know, essentially for all the type 1. The uptake took a bit of time as well. Um, and it, there was still a bit of inequity around, you know, certain areas were utilizing it more and frequently getting it quicker versus, versus a lot of the others. So it's about trying to make ensure that, well, one of the differences is that, is that postcode lottery in a way. We don't try and reduce that. Even though it's in nice guidelines, there'll get there'll be differences in, in every kind of ICB or every kind of locality saying what what's preferred and what's preferential. So that's something that 
we were taking a more top-down approach to try and reduce that that difference. Um, again, there's 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 different. If you look at it from a even a patient perspective, there's different health-seeking behaviours where people are aware mm. of of you know that it's available whether they want to, and, and different ethnicities, different cultures, different um, circumstances. Again, they may not. It, it, you can't, it's not always just based on healthcare; it's based on the individuals as well being aware and and wanting it as well. Um, I guess the, the, probably the other one as well you have to say is, is the cost involved. So again, you know, type one, we've got a million people. Type two, three, four, 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 five million people yeah. in the UK. So um, again, even a proportion of them are on insulins and giving them all that CGM. Again, it's the, it's the cost expenditure to the NHS, which in this environment with everything else going on, we've just got to be aware of. I'm not saying it's the main thing, but it's just something we've got to factor in into considerations. Brilliant. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that because that's really just a snapshot in a sense of what CGM involves with type 2 diabetes. I think this is an area that's just going to become a hotter and hotter topic. Uh, we're seeing more people even beyond the scope of diabetes getting access to these technologies. So I can only imagine what is now going to happen within the diabetes world as well. Um, so uh, we hope you've enjoyed that. If you have any comments, questions, queries, please do reach out to us across our social media platforms. But for today, uh, that's all from us. Take care. Bye bye.